that so you can start writing that stuff yourself. Um, all right, so without further ado, uh, we're going to go through a re-intro to some of you, intro from scratch for some others of C++, talk about what the memory management system is and like some little kinks, features, and syntax of the language. I know this isn't heavily covered in pen engineering, and so this will be a good chance for you guys to get like hands-on experience with a really low level, but you know, widely adopted um, language. Uh, we're going to move on through the Unreal specific modifications to C++, and then we're going to finish up with how you can actually integrate C++ into your blueprints. And I think that's where the real power comes from. It's saying, you know, I'm going to put my low-level logic and code somewhere, have it compiled, and it's probably not going to change very often because it's an algorithm or whatever that you write once and it's good. Bring, being able to leverage that algorithm by bringing it into blueprints and not having to write this like really nasty function call with 10 parameters all the time is really nice. And so um, that's the idea behind it. So, uh, moving on, C++ is a object-oriented superset of C. So any C function, any C related stuff that you guys have seen in 240 or 371 or 380 and the like is all usable in C++. Um, but it also has the concepts of classes and objects and all those familiar like, you know, programming language-y things that you see in Java and in C Sharp and in all those things. So just a brief sample here, who has programmed in C++ before? One, two, three, okay, so a couple of you. Who's programmed in C before? Or have you taken 240 or some, are you taking 240? Okay, that's good. So we have a wide sample of people who at least have some familiarity with um, a closer to assembly language language than Java. Uh, so this may be a little bit repetitive for you guys, but just to draw some contrast here from what you're normally used to seeing. Um, so in Java, all code must be in a class. All operations have ensured functionality, and everything is passed. Well, that everything is passed by copy is a conditional thing. So we'll talk more about that later. But there's garbage collecting. So the idea is that in a programming language, when you say I'm quote making an object somewhere on your computer in Java specifically, the the um, compiler or interpreter will go like reserve a bunch of bits, like a bunch of zeros and ones for you, and say this is where that little object that you just made is going to go. So in Java, there's a thing called the garbage collector that will essentially go say, okay, this, like, this program that's running has moved way past the point where the data stored in these bits is necessary, so I'm gonna delete it for you. But that happens at a passive pace, right? So the garbage collector runs in the background of any kind of programming thread and there's no active like, go delete this, right? It gets collected passively and that takes a lot of time and that's why Java is inherently like exponentially slower than C um, at the sake of making it easier to program in. So on the other hand, uh, C++, you choose the code organizational scheme. You can put stuff in classes, you can put stuff in files, it doesn't really matter, and it's totally up to you. Um, so you'll see that trend kind of going on here. Um, you can alter the functionality of operators. So in Java, like you're always taught to um, never use double equals when comparing objects, right? So that'll compare the memory address, that's a reference comparison. In C++, you can actually override equal equal and for custom data types. So say I have like an object. That has a couple properties. Say it has like int a and char star string. If I wanted to override equals, you could define something. The exact syntax is a little bit off from this. Operator double equal takes in another like object reference and then put logic in here that compares A to A and uh, the char pointers to each other. So that's a little like nice, nice neat thing that C++ lets you do. Um, you can also uh, choose how functional parameters are passed. So we did say in Java that everything is passed either by copy or by reference. In C++ you can actually say, you know, give me the exact bits of this parameter or give me like the location to where those bits are in memory or give me an alias or a shortcut to where I can find it. That's the idea. Um, and you must explicitly free memory when you're done using it. That's true for C++, but luckily for everyone in this room, Unreal garbage collects for you. So you will never have to write the leak. No leaks. That's a good thing. Um, but yeah, so any questions on this Java to C++ comparison at a high level? Um, we're going to go more into each one of these details, but just before we get started, that would be nice to ask. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so I've used a couple of words here. They may have seemed a little foreign. We have uh, values, references, and pointers. So the idea behind all three of these things is they're all different ways of representing or describing how to store or reference data in a programming language, and as fee-based programming language specifically. So if you look over on the right, I have int a equals 10. Everyone has seen that, that like, those t 10 or 11 characters, however many it is, will compile in like literally any language, unless it's OCaml and Arcane. Um, so that'll work. Uh, if you pat, uh, declaring something as a reference is the second line. So <coughs> we have int, that weird ampersand sign that tends to provide a lot of confusion, b equals a. <coughs> so a good way to understand a reference in English is that a reference is like if you're on a Windows computer, uh, you've probably seen a shortcut, and if you're on a Mac, you've probably seen an alias. So <coughs> the idea is that a reference is a fixed bound, like renaming of a variable. So saying int ampersand b is just saying like rename a and store it somewhere else. Well, actually store a reference to it somewhere else. Um, so that anytime you modify b, you'll actually also be modifying a. That's why I say it's like a shortcut. Um, now those two differ <coughs> from a pointer in that a pointer is literally saying all I'm storing in, the, in a pointer's actual data is the first memory address of the data of that object. So when I have int pointer c <coughs> equals the ampersand sign of a, that says int pointer c is an integer pointer that takes on the value of the memory address of a. <coughs> so all that end pointer is storing is like 0x some 64-bit memory address. Um, and pointers differ from, differ from references in a little bit, uh, but we'll talk about that in a second. Just one quick kind of buzzword question here. Why does a pointer only need to point to the first byte of what it points to? Who can kind of guess or infer or think about why the pointer only needs to hold that first memory address? Krishna? Exactly. So you'll notice that I, that's a strongly typed pointer, right? I said that's int star. So the language knows that's an integer pointer, which means that given the first memory address, all the compiler will have to do to figure out the rest of the data is say, okay, integers are 32 bytes long, so go look at this memory address and the next 32. Does that make sense to everyone? So, uh, we talked a little bit about these, but so defining a variable with an ampersand is a reference. Literally, like if you right click uh, something on your desktop or on anywhere on your Mac or PC and you click either make shortcut or make alias. So, anytime I change B, A will also change. Somewhat different, I declare int pointer int star C is ampersand A. So, that's a lot is going on there. So, we'll kind of go to the next bullet here and think about. Placing an ampersand next to a variable name means get the memory address in the computer where this thing is stored. So somewhere in the massive banks of your computer, everything has an addressing system, right? There's like 0x8 billion to 0x FFFF, whatever. So there's massive, there's space to store stuff in your computer and essentially giving, getting the pointer or memory address is just like getting the street address of your house. It just gets the location at which the data is stored. Um, so when you put an ampersand next to an existing variable, it'll get you that memory address. So when we declare int pointer C, we're saying, okay, store the memory address of A inside of this integer pointer and we'll call it C. So that's what the ampersand does and that's what declaring something with a star means. Uh, on the other hand, placing star next to, this is really confusing and don't ask me why everything is stars and ampersands, but placing star next to a variable means dereference, next to a pointer means dereference it. So like, Okay, they call things references and you dereference pointers and there's stars and ampersands everywhere. This will make sense once you start doing it more, but at the first glance it's probably a lot. Um, but if I put a star next to C, that tells the compiler, okay, go to the memory address at C and return to me the data that is stored there. So it's like saying, follow this little arrow and then go pull me what's at the end of it. And so that's why when I take star C, it gives me back an integer that I store in D instead of an integer pointer, which was like the line above it. Um, so, yeah, kind of like that. 
Um, any questions on this stuff so far? I'm cover. I'm kind of purposefully glossing over a lot of the internals of this because I wanted you to understand like the way it works on a high level first. Um, is this stuff like is anything confusing? Is anything on that right image confusing to you? Because it's really important that we like get that solid before we go into anything Unreal related. Okay, that's a good sign. Um, so a couple more points here that I wanted to talk about. Um, references, as I said, are immutable. So once B is bound to A, B will always be tied to A. There's no way to say like go B is an alias to some other variable. That doesn't work. So references are always going to be tied to what they're declared to. Um, and also integers, well pointers, specifically the integer pointer that we have here, have a few interesting properties. So if you guys remember, when I was talking about Java versus C++ in the beginning, we said that Java has what's called deterministic behavior for almost everything. Like there's very few instances in Java where you will call something and you won't know the, the results of the res that call or the range of results that it can be. So in C, you have, a, in a C-based language, you have a lot of det undeterministic properties. So who knows what the value of PTR will be if I just write that? Anyone who's worked with C++ before, don't make me call on you because I know who you are. Sorry? Exactly. It's some random. You, that's even more than I was looking for. It's some random value. So if you uninitial, if you declare an uninitialized pointer in star PTR, you'll notice I didn't put equals anything. That's going to get some like 0x, 7f, 3b, some random value that you don't really care about. It's not, well, there is a way of figuring out what it would be, but it's not relevant. So this is called undefined behavior. So a better way of doing something like this, if you have an integer pointer that you know you're going to need later, but you don't know what it is yet, you initialize it to null PTR, which is a keyword that in most interpreters will be defined as negative 1. So you're specifically saying, like, this integer pointer isn't initialized yet, so that when you do things like if, and then you use a truthy, so you say if, like, and then only in the parentheses you just put PTR, that will return false if it's null pointer. So it's a good way of just having some safety and protecting yourself against this undetermined functionality. Any questions on this stuff? Pointers? Should we do like, would it help if I did a couple like quiz style questions where I read some stuff on the board and you guys tell me what it means? Yeah? No? Hello? Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. Um, all right, so we've talked a lot about this concept of memory and places where you can store it. So there's two basic concepts in any memory unmanaged language. Those are the stack and the heap. So the stack is a place where you can think of it as a virtual thing that your uh, computer will create so that for every scope, so in a, the, the analogy of that is for anywhere in a program language where you have like the two brackets, you will have a stack. And what's stored in that stack is memory that you can use solely for the scope of that function. So saying like anywhere in my function that I declare something, those things will exist in the stack. And as soon as I leave the scope, or as soon as my function exits the scope that which it was just executing, it will all be freed for me. So the advantage there is that A, it's really fast, and B, it's managed totally by the CPU. So when a function exits or when the program counter exits a scope, everything that you have allocated will immediately disappear. So for those of you who have seen C, just, this should be a review. A is stored on the stack, but B is stored on the heap. Everyone has hopefully seen <coughs> malloc or something like it. So the idea is in C++, you use the keyword new, which you all have all seen from Java, and it does the same thing as a bottle, puts it on the heap. 
So just going right back into the heap, I store long-term variables that you need access to from more than one scope. So say you have like an object that maintains a, say you have an array of like actions that your player has done. Odds are those actions are gonna need to persist throughout the lifetime and maybe throughout more than the lifetime of that character. So like say the character dies and you destroy the character actor, maybe the previous actions that character has taken are still relevant. So that's probably something that you would put on the heap so that it can be accessed until you specifically say get rid of this. Um, yeah, so you access the heap via pointers. Um, you can never have like, unless you dereference a pointer, you can't like if you declare int as just a value, it will be on the stack. Um, so that's how you do it. Uh, and new and delete keywords in vanilla C++, we'll talk about what they mean in Unreal to access and create data and delete it on the heap. Any questions on heap versus stack? I'm hoping this is pretty repetitive because this stuff is covered in a lot of computer science classes. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about references specifically because this is a nice, like, tidy C++ feature. Um, so when you have a chain of function calls, as you see on the right there, what if foo is like five gigabytes of memory? You wouldn't want to copy it into every function call that you're calling on foo. So the idea is C++ will let you pass things by reference. So instead of like duplicating that content every time, you just store what essentially under the hood is just like a pointer, right? So you have like, int a is five. So say I'm in some place in my program where I have int a is five. And then I call some function that takes in, I don't know how to draw an ampersand, so I'm going to put reference. Um, <laughs> I can't draw ampersands in my work. Uh, all right, so you take in an integer reference. When this function, so when the program execution goes into this function, it's right here, there's another stack, and you'll have b that'll point to the first one instead of duplicating that memory again. Does that make sense? It's just like a pointer, but it handles all the dereferencing for you. And it's usually done on the stack. I mean, more often than not, it will be on the stack. So that's why references are useful. Um, this is a little bit repetitive on stack and heap. Uh, yeah, so again, this is similar to writing a function in C that takes in a pointer to a value and then you dereference the pointer to get the value, but it just makes it a lot cleaner and you don't have to do like a bunch of stars everywhere. Um, so Java does this for you. Um, most of the time in Java, when you pass a big, op like a custom data type that you've made into a function, it won't make a copy of the memory. It'll pass a reference for you under the hood um, and handle it the same way in assembly language that C++ will do it, but it won't tell you it's doing it. So that's uh, a little bit of a parallel. Other syntax related things. So in C++, you call things that are class level. So variables that are static or members of a class and not an object via the namespaced syntax. So my class is called some class. You put some class colon colon some function. And similarly, you can access a variable via some class colon colon variable name. This is just like in Java. If my class was called some class, you would do some class dot. Just in C++, they differentiate it by handling it the same way they handle namespaces. So um, a namespace in C++ is very similar to a package in Java. So like you can bundle your classes and module in like one big package and reference them with respect to the package and so on. Anyway, they use the double colon syntax. Um, other cool things, inline constructors. So the two bullet points under inline constructors do the exact same thing. Just a shorter way of writing it. So instead of saying like type and then variable name equals constructor of type. You can just write type variable name and then put the constructor directly in, next to it. Um, both of those instantiations happen on the stack, you'll notice, because I didn't use the new keyword. Um, but they're exactly the same thing and just like shorthand ways of writing. There's also this wonderful thing called auto. So if you have a for loop that goes through some array of vectors and you know it's going to be f vector, you can just put auto. And when you're actually writing your code in Visual Studio, it will do the type inferencing for you and do give you like code completion based on the type that it knows that vector to be. Um, so that you don't have to write some massively long and stupid class name 
every time if you have like a bunch of really long class names, it saves you some time. Also note that um, this is a good example of when references are useful. So I said for auto uh, reference to, well reference to auto, so say that's an F vector type. Say that's an F vector reference. There's no reason that my for loop should copy the data out of the array that I'm iterating through for me to manipulate it. Because you essentially should be manipulating the data that's stored in the array. So it'll give you a reference, so an alias, to the data that's stored in that array that you can modify. But you'll notice that you know, people always tell you not to delete things in for loops where you have like indices, because you'll you know, go over the same element twice. Or you know, there's a couple other edge cases there. You can't delete a reference, right? So if I like remove auto from this for loop, it, you can't like get rid of it. So it, it's kind of like an inherent protection. There's ways around this. You can code around like these limitations, but it kind of gives you an inherent protection around iterating through a for loop that you're deleting things from. So cool little things like that. Um, a couple other keywords. Virtual. Uh, many of you will recognize this from the class's little application thing. Uh, virtual lets you override in a subclass. So if you have a you guys have all seen this. We have a class that has something called uh, print my name, and it prints, say there's a class called student, and it prints student. If there's a class Sasha that's a subclass of student, print my name could print Sasha. Virtual, that's what it's used for. Static is the same thing with reference to classes like it is in every other language. If you really want to see some crazy stuff go on, use the static keyword outside of the class and watch what happens. It's really ridiculous. So if you have a C, like a C++ or a C file and you have a static variable, that variable won't like change, it'll persist forever. So if you have a loop that like changes stuff, that variable will always be locked when it's used in that file. So it's kind of like const with respect to a file, but that's not super relevant and people don't really use it that often. Um, const similarly is uh, the same thing as final in Java, so it just says you can't change this, yeah. For const, what if you are pointing to a, what if it's a pointer and it points to a thing? Good question. So if you const a pointer, this says I can't change the, the memory address of the pointer. I can still change the value at that memory address, but you can't change what the value of b is, like the actual 0x whatever thing. That's a really good question. It's actually covered in the 277 slides, which is what I did a lot of um, the basis of these slides from. Any other questions on const? All right, pragma once, I guess the last thing on here. That's the same thing as an include guard. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. It just should be at the top of every header you write. Um, any questions on these keywords? Pointers, references, fun stuff. No? All right, so this is what a class looks like in C++, in vanilla C++, I should say. Um, you'll notice a couple things. So class CPU, colon means inherence from. Module. So you'll notice there's an access modifier here, and that's saying that the fact that this CPU inherits from module is a public inheritance. So that's like accessible from everyone. Um, then you'll notice that there's another public declaration here, and unlike in Java where you say like every variable or function that you make has its own type specifier or access control specifier, so public, private, protected. In C++, you just put public colon or whatever access protector, and then all the content that's public will be under that. So there's a couple of enums, there's a constructor, and there's two virtual const char star returning functions that are also const. Who can tell me what, putting, what they think putting const on the end of a function will do? You'll notice that not only is the return type a const char pointer, but the actual function is denoted as const. Any ideas? Yeah, so all that will do is it's actually pretty cool. If you declare a function as const, the uh, this keyword inside of that function, so you guys have all seen this in Java and other languages, this will be marked as const inside of that function. So if you try to do things on this that are like modifying things, it'll, it won't compile. It'll say you're violating the const specifier. Um, and yeah, so const star just means it returns a const string. Any questions on this basic C++ class? So, time to blow your mind. This is what an Unreal C++ class looks like. Note that Unreal has nothing to do with making the background black. Um, can you guys all see, can, can someone close that window for me? Get you chill. Thanks, Devesh. Um, so, 
so there's a couple differences here from the uh, vanilla C++ class we just showed. Is that better than here? It's like easier to see. Yeah. So thank you. Um, the the number one noticeable difference is you guys will see all of these purple things. Who can get like okay, someone who has done C++ before, who knows what these purple things could be? Anyone? It may be a little far fetched. Is it just like insert code? Yeah, it's a macro. So if you guys have used C based languages, there's a thing called hashtag define. And all that does is say to the compiler, every time you see this string, replace it with this string. There are like thousands of ones, yeah. So um, we'll talk about what all this stuff means in a second, but the idea is that Unreal will augment your classes to abstract away a lot of this stuff for you. So, yeah. Sorry? Is everything public or everything private? Because we don't have like public protected private applications like this. Uh, there is public a actor on this one. So because actor is public, everything within the class. You can make pri the the long story short here is that you can make private and protected stuff, but protected is the one you you rarely will make private classes. Right? right? Protected classes make sense because if you can subclass it and so on, maybe it's useful to have some protected stuff. Um, but access modifiers for classes themselves are usually too blunt to be useful because oftentimes you don't want to make everything public or private. Anyway, does that answer your question a little bit? I thought in C++, like when you have a class, like within it, you can't set each of the functions. To yeah, so, yeah, like, like that. Yes, yeah, so you can do that, same way. Um, if, you, if you default, like the default here is just public. Yeah, you know, there's a couple like syntax problems. You'll notice that this doesn't have a closing bracket. Um, it's just meant to be as an example. So yeah, let's talk about these Unreal specific macros. Um, so uh, we just talked about this. You can manually define macros for the compiler by typing hashtag define, and then some string and then some other string, and it will replace them the same way a, a regular expression replace would happen. And all three of these macros are defined inside of Unreal. So let's talk about each one. So uclass at the top is something that you put in every Unreal memory managed class. And what that will do is insert a whole bunch of junk in the top that tells Unreal exactly how big the object is and a bunch of these like you know meta information. It actually expands, um, Trunk can check me on this, but I think that expands to a couple hundred lines of code. Um, similarly, the second line there, so project base system API, the reason that's before, um, before the, the class name and after the class keyword is because that essentially provides you a namespace so that will actually, internal to Unreal, it will actually say, okay, this class belongs to this part of the engine, this game and not to the entire engine. Um, and you can see that elaborated more here. Uh, so the idea is that if you're writing game code, your game code should be in a separate module than the engine's code. And so all that like project-based system API um, will do that for you. And you'll notice that uh, when you do this yourself, Unreal will do all this, like if you make a class through their wizard, it will do all this for you. And uh, project based system API is just a, like a um, default like name. So if your project was called like arrow shooting API or arrow shooting, it would be arrow shooting underscore API. Um, last one, generated U class body, is the second part of U class that puts all of the Unreal class specific methods that you'll notice are scoped to the class and not to the entire file inside of your class for you. So that's what that stuff does. Any questions on these three macros or the, any? concerns about this stuff that I'm talking about. So the best way to think of these is tools that Unreal provide for you to make our lives as game programmers easier. Um, this is a great example of when you shouldn't reinvent the wheel. So the idea is that like Unreal already did all this memory management for you and like templating and all that stuff. So there's no reason to write it again because obviously those guys spent a long time doing it and were, you know, there was a team. It was not a, you know, one person thing, so just use what they give you. Uh, and we'll cover many more features and macros later that will help you merge your C++ and your blueprints in a great way. So we talked a little bit about C++ uh, allocation and deallocation. Um, Unreal has a completely different system than the natural C++ way, and that's pretty much the only way to say it, but as opposed to using new to create objects on the heap, there is a method that is generic, so it takes in a type 
called new object that takes in the type of object you want to make and then a couple, you know, whatever parameters you want to shove into that constructor, you guys can explore it on your own time. But uh, that's essentially a templated method that does all of the new, like, heap-based memory allocation for you and puts it in the Unreal Garbage Collector system so that it knows it exists and it'll go collect it when it's done. Does this part make sense? So just, you won't use the new keyword, you'll use new object. If it's a U object subclass. So actor is, you guys remember the chart, actor inherits from object, so on. Well, it's from a lot of other things before that, but yeah. Anyway, uh, similarly, you will not use delete the same way you would in normal C++. There is an object, there is a method called conditional begin destroy. I know that's verbose. Um, you rarely ever will have to call this yourself, and it usually will be okay. If you don't, it'll usually clear the memory for you. But conditional begin destroy essentially marks that object to the garbage collector as ready for collection. So the next time the garbage collector makes a pass, it'll go delete it. Idea being that you never communicate with the collector directly, it runs on its own schedule, and you just like mark things that it will go make decisions based off. But uh, these systems are for allocating and deallocating objects. So the system for actors is a little bit different. Now, I think everyone by this point should have seen the spawn actor node and blueprint. Guess what, that's actually written in C++. And it takes the exact same signature as it does in a blueprint. So spawn actor, generic with the type, and then you know all the parameters of the spawn actor thing that you saw in your blueprints as inputs. So like where it is in the world, what its instigator is, and so on. Uh, also the same way in blueprints you can destroy things with the destroy method, there is a destroy in C++. They're identical. And yeah, so it's pretty cool that the same way Epic surfaces their C++ code to blueprints is exactly what we're going to be showing today. Um, and that kind of exposes the power of it, right? You wouldn't want to handle like bits. You, can you imagine like traversing bytes and like memory addresses in a blueprint? This sounds horrible. So those are all written in C++. So now that we've kind of talked about this, um, many of you have had some experience with blueprints. You've seen like why they're good, how nice it is to have a visual language, but they also kind of suck for some things. You don't, for loops, for example, like this for loop right here, I mean, this would be like three or four lines of C++ and would probably look a lot more readable to a programmer than this would as a blueprint. I don't, can you guys read those nodes? It's pretty small. So there's like a for each, and it does a couple things, and then it branches at the end. Um, so, you know, good note that this could probably be done better in C++ and since the uh, APIs are almost identical in terms of name between Blueprints and C++, all of the features that you guys have been doing, like get actor location, set rotation, all of those have the same names in C++. So you already know a lot of the API, you've just been using it in a little different manner. So all the stuff you've learned will carry over. It's just good to now that you've had some experience, see why one is useful over the other in certain circumstances. So this begs the natural question. <coughs> Trung is on my team and he's writing this C++ and I want to be able to use his stuff. We need to be able to call it from blueprints. So here's where it gets really interesting. Uh, the theory of surfacing a function, method, variable, or class to a blueprint is the ability to use it in a blueprint if it's written in C++ and so the blueprint designers can consume it. So who can think of a situation where surfacing some language element from C++ to a blueprint would be useful? And then we'll talk about what you can and can't serve. Think back to also what the Unreal API provides you and what would not be good, similar to Spawn Actor, to write in blueprints. All right, I'm going to pick on you. Jason, give me some kind of starting point here. Where would you, what, would, what do you think would be something that would be better written in C++ and then accessible via a blueprint based on what you've done so far? Kelly, is that a hand or is that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to relieve you, Jason. So, in ours, when we're like creating our, um, I guess my blurb to you, I have like an invested for 
Sure. Yeah, right? It looks really nasty, so... Exactly, right? So, like, there's there's one execution path here from a, com, from a loop body, right? But that that's, like, the inner of a for loop. On complete is what happens after, and then you have two white execution lines, and it looks really messy, and it's hard to follow. So that's a great example. Um, the canonical example that I often use and that makes it easier for me to think about is you guys have seen, like, the on hit event, right? Like, it, it sends out, like, 30 parameters. Can you imagine doing that in Blueprint? Like, my god. That would be like so many white lines everywhere and probably be a mess. So um, better to define a struct in C++ and then return the struct and break it up and stuff like that. Does that theory, like at least at a high level, did that make sense? Um, could you guys foresee any other instances of stuff that you've done that you prefer would be in code and that like maybe one of your other teammates could use after you've written in code? I, this is out of curiosity. I'm not, you know, pressuring for an answer. So like maybe so for our game, we have two different paths for two different players. Mm -hmm. But then in order to do that, I might need to like basically change uh, the, the paths into like different. It's going to be really hard to distinguish between paths. And I think it might be better to have it in code where you yeah. build this inside this and this was. Perfect, right? Like what if you had like a path like class and both of them inherited from it, right? That's a great example. Um, so the idea that, and the reason we we decided to kind of teach Unreal this way was that so you guys can see all the huge benefits of Blueprint, right? There's certain things that are just like, that at least for me are amazing. Like the way it's very natural to see the flow of something and how variables that like usually you'd have to recompile the change, you just change a value and push save and it's done. That stuff is really good, but a lot of the, the downsides you don't really see until you've done it for a little bit. And so that was the reasoning behind um, starting with Blueprints and like going to C++. So yeah, um, going back. So let's talk about what you can surface. This is where it gets kind of cool. And these are where these macros will be like your best friend and worst enemy because if they don't compile, it's really okay. And the error messaging is not good. Um, but, so we have a couple of things here. Uh, highlighted in yellow. So U property takes is a macro that takes in a couple things. So visible anywhere, blueprint read only, and then it takes in a category. So you would put that macro above your normal function declaration. And uh, who can take a stab at what that first parameter means? Visible anywhere. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. There's two words. It's visible anywhere. right? You can see it from anywhere. Uh, blueprint read only. It's exposed outside of the class. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's like having a public variable. That's the, the canonical like example. Uh, blueprint read only is pretty simple. That just means you have a getter in your blueprints, but you can't set it in a blueprint. Um, so like for immutable things, that's good. That third one, category. Who can take a guess at what that category may be? All right, I'm gonna show you. What was that a guess? So like, um, I'm guessing like uh, those, those like static whatever mesh or all these other different Close, mm -hmm. actually very close. Namespaces. Namespaces are yes, you're actually on track with namespaces. But I think both of you were very very close. But I think once I show you in the editor, it'll like there'll be a light bulb type moment. So hopefully this thing will start up and not crash OBS this time. Um, Basically, the way you have to think about all of these macros is that Epic have made all of these macros as a way for programmers to make their content that they create understandable by designers who maybe aren't as well versed in the internals of programming. Like maybe their designers know how to write Python or some scripting language, but maybe they don't know exactly how C++ memory allocation works. So that's why these surfacings are super useful. So if a designer comes in, and it's like, doo -doo -doo, I want to do something. All of these are categories. So your category specifier will determine where it pops up in this blueprint context sensitive menu. So a pretty cool way for you to organize your stuff. Um, very easy to see if it's there or not. If you did it right, you just go look at the category and if it's there, it's not. And so on. So yeah, that's how you declare a property. So an actor or an object 
um, as blueprintable. Any questions on that? Okay, I'm specifically going slow through this stuff because um, like, this is going to be foundational to anything you guys code, so I want to make sure it sets in. Um, the next thing is functions. So the same way you have u property, you can imagine u function does something very similar. Um, the u function macro, you need to put above every function, regardless of if you want it to be in blueprints. But there's also a first parameter, unfortunately not mentioned on this slide, called blueprint callable. So if you put blueprint callable before you have like category equals, you'll be able to call that function from a blueprint. Same idea. Now here's where it gets really, really powerful. So events. We've talked a lot about like the difference between functions and events, and you can replicate events and all that good stuff. Events are the number one use case where surfacing is going to be really great. So we talked like on hit, right? On, hits is, on hit is an event that every actor has if the actor has a collider. So the idea is that you can write like internal math logic in your classes in C++ and then since the people, since most of the logic for like how your game behaves from the user's point of view are in the blueprints, your C++ code won't know what happens as a result of an event and you can actually bind things to that event the same way you do them in blueprint. So say you have a bunch of math to calculate like when the person's right hand is like, what's a good example for the, for the bow and arrow here? So say you have a bow and arrow, right? Say you have a bunch of math that checks every tick for when the pullback, so when the right hand has reached the maximum position that that arrow can stretch, right? Because you can't pull it all the way back here, right? Maybe the bow stretches this much. Maybe you fire an event that says like on bow max pullback or some better name than that. And maybe that automatically releases the arrow. What you can do is write that code in C++ that says, okay, you have position A, which is the left hand in the bow. You have position B, which is the right hand in the arrow. And when, position, when the magnitude of the distance between A and B is, less than some is greater than some constant, fire an event to a blueprint, and then maybe the blueprint automatically fires the arrow. Does that, that's a great, I think a great example of when those events are bindable and useful, right? Because the math that says like, okay, on tick, is this length greater than some, okay, get the two vectors, get the world location, get the magnitude of the difference, and then check if that float is less than a value. That's pretty annoying to do in blueprints, but in C++ is like two lines. So fire that event off, and then you have some great interop. So um, one way to do this is U function and then blueprint native event. Uh, there's a caveat here. So if you put blueprint native event, this is where it's helpful to have the editor open. All of these are blueprint native events because, oh no, not those, sorry. Those are not. So this is a blueprint native event, tick. And that's because the event tick is defined on this actor blueprint. The event tick doesn't come from a component, whereas on these components, so on component begin overlap, this event is not generated from this actor class. It's generated from a component of this class, which is like a collider. First, before I even go into talking, does everyone understand that difference of where the event comes from? Yes? Someone give me some validation here, yeah. So if the event emits from the, from the class in which you want to bind logic to it, you can use blueprint native event. So tick is a good example of that and so on. If it doesn't, so if it comes from a component, so say you have the bow, your, your first person character, right? And you have a component on both hands, or say you have a component on the bow that's like bow force generator or something. If you want to trigger an event from the bow that told you when something is done, like maybe when the bow is finished firing, or even better example, maybe when the bow has been pulled back enough and it needs to shoot, you trigger an animation so it like bounces the string around. Not that that's a requirement, but that's a good example of when an action would need to happen on that bow itself. Then you need to use something called multicast delegates. That is a big name. I'm going to get to that at the end of the day because you know Trung I think can vouch for me here that using the multicast delegate system is probably one of the most complicated things you'll do in Unreal C++. And I figured, for me, it took like a long time to self-teach it, and I think it's nice to have someone explain it to you. So we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, another cool thing you can do is a blueprint function library. So at the end of today, it looks like we're going to have time. I will show you guys exactly what this means, but if you have a bunch of code that you have in C++ that essentially are like static functions, so they don't take in a ref, like they're not of any actor, 
you can make a blueprint function library. So say you have some API. On, say you're trying to get like articles from the New York Times or something. There's a New York Times like uh, REST API. And in C++, you could get like a REST client, so something that can communicate with the New York Times API, write a bunch of stuff in there, and then make a blueprint function library that has some functions that are like, get latest articles about this. And then it'll return those to blueprint in like maybe an array of strings or something. But all the implementation can be in a library because it's not relevant to any actors in your scene. So that's a cool thing. Um, we use them all the time. They're super helpful. Uh, the key takeaway is to essentially defer complicated math and like conditionals. So anytime you have like a bunch of branches, probably means it's something you should have done in, in C++. Um, but yeah. So now we're going to talk about multicast delegates. This slide is a lot, so we're going to go through it easily. Um, the, this is on the slide, but uh, the concept of delegates and consumers is a concept that's widely used in almost every programming language you can think of. So what a delegate means is, if there's an event that happens on one part of your whole com programming like compiled system, but say it happens all the way over here, and there's like other things that happen here, here, and here, that need to know when this thing happens, you make a delegate. And what that delegate does is announces messages that other components can subscribe to to know when they happen. So it's kind of like having like a news feed, like they release something and then a bunch of stuff happens. Same idea. Um, and it's an efficient way of perceiving and managing who is subscribed to what so that there isn't a bunch of coupling between these different features, right? Like this thing doesn't depend on this thing. It just gets a message from somewhere that something happened. It doesn't matter how the thing is actually implemented as long as the message comes through. So it's a nice uh, software engineering um, concept. It abstracts away a lot of stuff. Uh, Unreal's events are a multicast-based delegate system. So a good analogy, show of hands, who's used Python before? Okay, so more than half the class. Who has seen the logging module? Like import logging. Okay, so if you haven't seen the logging module, um, if you ever write anything in Python that's more complicated than a basic script, say a web server, you probably want to have something to, some way to log stuff that isn't just print, because that can get kind of messy. So there's a system called logging, where if you implement a logger, like you implement the logging, you import the logging module, and then you register what are called different handlers. So say like there's different parts of your web server that need to report different messages that need to go different places. Like maybe the database reports to someone and the front end reports to your front end developers, all of that. That's a great example of a delegate system where logging handlers subscribe to the delegate that something has happened. Um, just a case in point example. So let's talk about the way Unreal does this. This is like macro help. So um, there are these really complicated macros that basically say, Declare a dynamic multicast delegate. That's an awful. And if your multicast delegate, so if your event doesn't send any parameters, so it just sends out a white execution line in, in blueprints, you just put what you want the event to be called. It has to start with that. So f on failed cast. That says, okay, there's an event called on failed cast, or of type this thing that you just made, called on failed cast. So in my blueprints, I'll have something that says when a cast fails, do this. You'll notice that I put the same U property designations that we were talking about earlier, blueprint assignable, and then gave it a category. That's the first one, the on fail. So the second one, well, I guess it's actually the first one on here, it says declare a dynamic multicast delegate with one parameter, so underscore one param. This takes in a couple of things. So first, the, the type of the event you're creating. So events have types the same way objects have types. So this is an event that's of type on succeeded cast. It takes one parameter of type spell enum, so e spell type enum. You'll notice that enum start with e, framework features start with f, actors start with a, objects start with u, so on. You can find all those online. And then this third parameter is just the name of what you want that to be called. So the on succeeded cast event will say, okay, some cast succeeded, and this is the spell that the person casted. That's this, the name of this property. So same way, when I declare it down here, u property, blueprint assignable, category, spell casting, and then there's an event of type on succeeded cast called on succeeded cast. It's really repetitive, but essentially it's, C++ is a strongly typed language, so your events need to have types. So what that will produce is this. You'll get a blueprint event. You'll notice that's called on my something called one tracker. 
And you have these two red events, on failed cast and on succeeded cast, and I chain them to some method called proper log that logs the result. So yeah, that's a great, um, well, I don't know if it's great. That's an intro to talking about how to surface C++ into blueprints. So we have 20 minutes left. Um, what I was going to do was to dive into a project that uh, I've worked on in the past and show you guys this stuff in action. Um, what I wanted to ask you, oh yeah, we'll go, I'll go through these first before we go to the next part. So, gotchas. We talked about this a little bit with like the E succeeded spell cast thing and the F on whatever. Unreal has their own naming convention and stuff actually won't compile if you don't name it right. So, <laughs> name it right. And the good news is the compiler errors that happen because you don't name something right are pretty descriptive, but Things that are actor subclasses start with A. Things that are subclass of U objects start with U. Things that are part of the framework start with F. And things that are like data types, or things that are data structures start with T. Um, so again, like the more you explore C++, the less that will be memorization and more just you'll look at it and be like, okay, that makes sense. Um, always important that you hit the compile button inside of the editor you guys probably don't have this in your editors because you don't have C++, but if you do have C++, there is, uh, yeah, where did my compile button go? Well, this is interesting. There should be a compile button right here. I probably didn't get pull, but there will be a button right here that says compile, and at the end of this when we demo, I'll show you what that does. It's important that you use that compile tool and not Visual Studio's normal compile button because if you compile with Visual Studio, you'll rebuild the entire like 20 gigabyte engine and it will take hours. You don't want to do that. So Unreal provides a lot of um, built-in tools like the Unreal header tool and the Unreal build tool to decide exactly what modules it needs to compile for your game to run to save you the time of compiling the entire engine over again. Um, also, Visual Studio's error reporting is not very good. So if you write some code and it's underlined in red and you like are pretty sure it works, don't rely on Visual Studio to tell you that the syntax is bad because it doesn't know about all the macros, and sometimes you just need to compile it with the engine to see if it works. So if you think something is good, and Visual Studio says it's bad, and you're pretty sure it's good, it's probably good, and Visual Studio is probably just lagging, because it has to index a lot of stuff, and as I said, Visual Studio compiles take a long time, and you know the way it knows when you've made an error is it compiles in the background and will tell you like this is what didn't let it compile. So don't rely on the error reporting from Visual Studio. Um, and if your program, this happened to me for like a week and it took me a long time to figure out what happened. If your project crashes immediately when you like double click it in the launcher, you definitely put some stuff in a constructor that didn't, Unreal didn't like, like an object constructor. So going back to what I said that the editor does when you like, someone asked a question a couple lectures ago, you know, why does my battery die so fast when I use Unreal? If you remember, I said the editor actually plays your game in the background, it just turns off the tick method that signifies time is changing. So what does that mean? That means it actually calls the constructor on everything you write when you start the, end, when you start the editor. So if you have something that doesn't start, it definitely, if the editor doesn't start, it definitely means you have a bad constructor. Um, that's a gotcha that I'm, yeah, don't, don't, don't be me. Don't spend a lot of time figuring out that that's the problem. Uh, and yeah, so always better to put stuff into begin play or in your own function called init. Um, yeah. So now, going back to this, uh, we have 20 minutes left, so I can do one of two things. I can show you guys what these surfaced events look like, or we can go into some networking stuff. So I wanted to ask you guys what you think would be more relevant. Would you prefer that I talk about some networking, or would you prefer that I go into, you know, C++ -y things. Yeah. So raise your hand for networking. Raise your hand for C++. Shit. Okay, networking. <laughs> uh, let's do it. All right, so uh, this is a game that I made with Trung, actually Caro too, so let me Sorry guys, give me a second to pull from git. Hmm. 
So you'll notice that uh, this time when I started up the engine, I closed it away pretty fast. But it told me that I had um, things that needed to be recompiled before the engine can start up. Well, actually, this is telling me it needs substance. So let me go to the marketplace. Come on. So this is just happening because the computer that I made this project on had this plugin installed, and my laptop doesn't. So it's like, where is it? Luckily, it's free. So I'm going to grab it right now, and then we'll dive right into it. <coughs> so um, for logistics, in the meantime, um, I have office hours today from 4 to 6. Uh, Chung, when are your next ones? Friday. Friday. Okay, so after the project is due. Uh, okay, so my point was I have today, I think Emily has on Wednesday, and I think maybe Gian has tomorrow also. Uh, anyway, the point is there's a lot of office hours before the beta demos. Please come to office hours because we will like sit down with you and code with you side by side and help with your project, and that's always a good thing. So that was my uh, advertisement of the day. So you'll notice that when I start up the editor this time, it says I have this DLL that I don't have and I need to compile it. That's because I added some source, so actual C++ files to my project before, since the last time I ran it on this machine. So that happens sometimes. Now it's telling me that it won't compile, and you can't start a game if it won't compile. So the trick here is actually good that this is happening. There's a couple of things you can do to resolve this problem. So what most likely happened, uh, Windows Explorers, or Internet Explorers, so annoying. Um, what most likely happened is that I had some outdated stuff and saved intermediate build and binaries. So you can safely delete that stuff We'll run it again. You'll see it'll regenerate them. If it doesn't compile this time, I'm going to have to go into the source and see exactly what's going on. Try to find where in my source code I have something that's preventing it from compiling. Now, it should be pretty obvious um, because if something won't compile, like it's much more obvious than finding a runtime bug. So unlike where if the project starts up and the editor won't start up because you have a bad constructor, it should be a little easier for us to find when something doesn't compile. Um, but you'll notice that when I double click the project, it, this is like the Unreal build tool. This isn't um, Visual Studio's compiler. So it's good that we're using this to save some time. Um, my laptop is also dying because it's compiling a lot of stuff. And there it goes. So if you ever see something like that, the moral of the story here is if the editor doesn't start up and you think it should be running, go delete all of those intermediary folders. So saved, intermediate, build, and binaries. Um, that clears out all the stuff that the engine has cached to save time and then uh, start it up from scratch. So now we have this thing. And now I have my C++ classes. There are my classes. And I also have this gorgeous compile button. This is the one you push, not the C++ one. So if I compile, that's a wonderful sound. Um, and now, if I uh, double click one of these files, it'll start up Visual Studio. And hopefully it'll bring the file up. There it is. And so this is a cool like example of what's useful in C++. So this is a function called eSpell type enum, or that returns eSpell type enum. This is a good example of going through some C++ syntax at the same time. Um, it's a part of the uGraphNode object, and the function name is validate. So it takes in a constant array of integers as a reference called sequence, and another const integer called id, or idx, index. So you'll note that this is, uh, did, I, is this, did I make this recursive? Yeah, so this is a recursive function. Uh, you'll notice that I call it again here on line 30. Um, this is not something you would want to do in blueprints, right? Recursion and blueprints don't really 
like how who can even imagine how you would do that, right? You'd have an execution that goes in a loop. Um, generally a bad idea. So it also has the const modifier and the end of this function. But this is a, a function that basically will take in an array of integers. So like you know, one, two, three, four, not in order, three, one, two, whatever. And then go through them and check to see if those integers validate against this state machine that we built in the before. So this like edges.validate is another um, recursive call down the, the tree of this, this array. So it's not important that you know exactly what the array is doing, but you can perceive this as like a big DFA that validates whether one traversed path of like all of these numbers fits into one of our things that we've determined is a valid path for casting a spell. And that's why it returns an eSpell type enum that says whether it's valid, invalid, or that like, this is both invalid or the actual spell itself. So again, like if you can imagine a blueprint, this would be one, two, three, four, five, four loop, another bunch of nodes. You notice I use auto. This would be a mess. And so it's really good that we did it in C++. Um, I will show you also what the header of this looks like. So I actually uh, realized that the newer versions of Unreal, as opposed to what I have in the slides, you just put generated body instead of generated U-class body. Um, and it needs to be inside public. So it's a good point for me to make an addendum to the slides. Uh, but you'll notice that like, I have Visual Studio open, and it's been open for a while, and there's no syntax highlighting. Everything is, except for keywords is white. It's a great example of the fact that if I make a change right now, the Visual Studio like, syntax detection tool that will tell you if you, it thinks you've made an error will be invalid. So if I do like, See, it didn't even mark it as an error, right? Like that obviously won't compile. Um, so yeah, not always good to trust Visual Studio with this. Pretty simple here. I have this uh, thing called validate. Doesn't need you function because, well, frankly, it's not called from anything in blueprints. Usually it would be good practice for me to put it there anyway. Um, I also have a variable of spell type enum that has a default value. So you'll notice that if you assign something inside of a header file, you can give it a default value um, as opposed to this int value which has nothing and an array of other graph nodes so remember we said this was a DFA um, of edges and there are pointers so quite simple this is literally just an adjacency list um, and yeah so U class gave it a group it's in the custom classes and it's a blueprint spawnable component which means that if I go back to my dude over here, he has, that is not what I meant to do, this thing. And you'll notice that I have events bound, where are the events? Maybe I don't have the events bound to it yet. But anyway, there's a couple of events down here I can call. So the on failed and on succeeded cast that you guys saw earlier. That, that was from this project, and now I have that event that I can change to. So yeah, that's a brief intro. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to show, and that is the networking. So, I think I did the level blueprint. Right. So uh, fortunately, the Unreal networking system has better documentation and blueprints than it does in C++, so you can follow along with what I'm doing if you go look up the documentation. But, uh, so, get game instance, post game start, all this is just events that I'm calling and other functions, but you'll notice that this is in the level blueprint. So this is specific to this level, because this is like the level that people join into when they start the game. It doesn't start them right in the game. So say when they press uh, J, follow this execution, we'll call refresh server event on the server spawner actor that I have elsewhere. So I double click this, it'll take me to the server spawner actor. Just some empty actor, just sits in my level, has no renderer. And then it does a couple things. So, refresh server's event. It says get player controller for index zero. Remember we talked about what player controller is, networking uh, terminology of that player. Uh, takes in a player controller, takes in at most find sessions, says go find other games that exist, find at most 10 of them. And then you'll notice that it has this little clock thing. So what that means 
is for those of you who have ever written JavaScript, this is like the, the node taking a callback. So it's an asynchronous operation, which means that if you plug into this first execution node right here, this will fire, like the, the code will keep running, but this find sessions may not be done yet. So instead of building my logic off of immediately right away after it finishes, I'm gonna say when it's done finding things and it's succeeded, take in a result, which is a, it's an array of blueprint session result structures. <laughs> So Unreal did all this for us, right? I save it as a local variable, the server's over there, and then I move on. And on failure, we do the same thing. So, well, on failure, we just don't save, but we do the same thing. So, naturally, after I've saved the list of servers that I can possibly join, I get the length of that array, and then I print it out, so found that many servers, and then I said repopulate servers in the game. So this is just for logging sake. I printed how many servers there were. There's another function called repopulate. So what this will do is it'll first say, this is a macro. So clear the server. So I should first say that what this does is that this function I'm showing you, sorry for not having this context beforehand, makes a bunch of spheres that correspond to the games that I can join. And if I touch one, I join it. So Naturally, clear. so every time you refresh the server list, you need to get rid of what was there beforehand because it's probably invalid. So go take this thing and then destroy the spheres that were in this sphere list beforehand. And then once you're done, clear the array that had them. Notice this is a two-step destroy. I can't just clear the array because the actors that are in that array will still persist. So go delete the actors and then clear the array. After I'm done with that, some logging, and then for each through the new servers, you'll notice that servers and spheres are two different things. So spheres are the actors that I have in my level, and servers is the metadata that I got back from the service that tells me what servers are available. For each through all the servers, print, so log that I'm creating some spheres, take in the index of the for loop and the actual element, and then this is a mess. So given that index, this is a bunch of vector math, 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 that all results in a spawn location for that sphere and makes a sphere in the game. And my sphere is a different class that has some properties that say on hit, you know, join X game. And you'll notice that after I spawn them, I have a thing that sets the actual session so that each sphere corresponds to a game that you can join so that when you hit the sphere, you know what to join. That's a property of the child act that I just spawned. Um, and then add it to the array of spheres so that I know how many spheres are in the level, and then when I refresh it again, I can clear them and make new ones. Um, this part is super largely unimportant. All this is is some little, like, hacky integer boolean flipping that makes it so there's one sphere right there, right? All this does is make it so the first one spawns on the right, second one spawns on the left, Third one spawns further on the right, fourth one spawns further on the left. It just makes them expand radially out from a given point so that they all look continuous and they don't like go off to the right of the screen. So it starts in the center and then they go one here, one here, one here, one here, so on. That's all that math does. And yeah, so that's about all for today. Um, I'm happy to sit down with you guys and help you come up with a way to join these, uh, these games themselves and provide a many to do so. The only important takeaway is that I really want to show you from this thing our find sessions. And then, oh, it's not listed in this thing. There's another note, I'm not gonna go to it right now. There's another note that says join session that takes in a session object and then connects you to that game. And that's it. Once you've joined the session, the other game takes over, so you don't need to say like go to this level or go to that level, it just automatically joins you into the game that they're playing. And that's all. So uh, thanks, guys. And um, yeah, thanks for participating in this class. Hopefully, everything goes OK.